All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Victor. I work at Cosmonic. We work on an open source uh, WebAssembly host called Wasm Cloud. Uh, and I want to talk today about the uh, using OTEL uh, and how observability looks and can look in WebAssembly. Uh, so just a quick agenda. First, we're going to talk about observability, right? Just, just a quick level set on what I assume everyone's doing and, and sort of looking to do in their own observability stacks. Uh, the WebAssembly, the sort of what and the why for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, and then sort of how these come together, right? Uh, a quick show of hands. How many people have used WebAssembly before? Okay. All right. So um, for people who are watching, that's about, let's say, 10 people, um, which is more than, more, than, uh, more than has been in the past. Um, but just going on to observability, um, this, I think, is pretty, pretty standard for everyone in this track, and everyone's kind of used to this stuff. But in general, when I say observability, I mean getting metrics, traces, logging, uh, and visualization. Um, as previous talks have mentioned, there's also profiling now is, is, is now part of OTEL. But, um, but primarily, we're looking at getting these um, hooked up to our apps and figuring out how our apps perform uh, and how they behave. Uh, what I think is new to, to most people in the, in, in the room is WebAssembly, right? So what is WebAssembly? This is something I want to sort of level set here as well. WebAssembly is a compile target. So just like you'd compile, let's say, like a Go binary or a uh, Rust binary or um, other, other languages to a program that can run on x86, right? That's just binary data. If you open the file, there's just you know, uh, gibberish in there, uh, binary in there. Um, WebAssembly is a kind of binary format that you compile your programs to, right? So you, just like if you were compiling to a binary that runs on uh, a certain architecture, you compile your code to a binary that runs on WebAssembly, or runs on a WebAssembly runtime. Uh, this is similar to the jar and the Java model, right? So in Java, you compile, a jar, uh, you compile Java code to a jar, and that runs you know, on a uh, Java virtual machine, right? Uh, and that's a very, very similar uh, experience to WebAssembly, except that you probably wouldn't try and embed Java or the JRE anywhere <laughs> in, uh, that isn't you know, already Java. Uh, but this you can do with WebAssembly. So uh, Wasm Time is the uh, flagship WebAssembly runtime, and it embeds very, very easily. Uh, along with being able to embed easily, you have really good security. So this is, uh, everything is isolated by default, right? There are, there are, you can't access the file system. You can't uh, make network calls by default in WebAssembly. And there is a lot of support across many different ecosystems. So one of the things about WebAssembly that's different, and uh, sort of different especially with that JAR example, uh, and, and Java in general, is that many languages compile to WebAssembly. Uh, and this list is actually growing uh, basically every month. And as more languages sort of push changes upstream, that uh, enable support for WebAssembly. So it's sort of uh, organized with best support in the top left and sort of continuing, continuing over to the right. Um, but a lot of great support is in Rust. And then Go has uh, very good support, uh, including Big Go and a smaller subset called Tiny Go. Uh, and then many of the other languages there have great um, WebAssembly support. And this list is growing. So in general, why should you care? Right? Uh, WebAssembly is a new binary format. You may not be writing code that targets it yet. Um, but I think in the future you will. Uh, it is lighter, faster, uh, and in general, uh, more secure than containers in general. And we, right now, spend most of our time deploying to containers and deploying often very, very large containers. And that's something that you don't have to do with WebAssembly. WebAssembly artifacts, so like your program, once it's compiled, should be on the order of kilobytes. So kilobytes may be megabytes. And me honestly, megabytes is, is too big. Uh, but you know, we deal with sometimes with components that are on the order of 10 megabytes when we um, build interpreters and have to, we have to stuff the whole interpreter inside. But in general, you should be dealing with much, much smaller artifacts. And this means faster boot times. This means faster response time um, for when you're um, uh, doing like something like a cold start. Uh, and it means just everything running faster in general. Uh, one thing that's important about WebAssembly is that it's not a WebAssembly or containers, or a WebAssembly or Kubernetes uh, scenario, they work together, 
So WebAssembly can run very well in a container. Um, we develop Wasm Cloud, which is a completely open source uh, project that runs WebAssembly and makes it easy to run. And we run in containers. We run on Kubernetes. We run on bare metal. You know, we run on your local machine. Uh, you don't have to. It, this is not sort of a big cloud tech, if that makes sense. Uh, and one important thing about WebAssembly and how we use WebAssembly in particular at Cosmonic and what we do with Wasm Cloud is that you can avoid patching multiple dependencies uh, in multiple places. So we build a distributed WebAssembly or a way to run WebAssembly in a distributed manner so you can patch one area and have all your apps update. So most famously, in, in recent, uh, recent time, the log4j vulnerability sort of affected a lot of systems at the same time and led to the patching of multiple, uh, multiple environments. So obviously, this means a lot of people spent a lot of time sort of just running around and doing nothing but updating log4j. And if you've written any like Java, you know that that's like opening <laughs> a POM XML somewhere, trying to figure out where the dependencies are, and like going through, and honestly, probably having a pretty bad time. But one of the ways we can get away from this and really centralize this problem so that we can fix it really easily is with WebAssembly. WebAssembly is also cloud native. So it's growing in its adoption amongst cloud native companies, and this is only going to continue. Uh, obviously, the cloud native landscape is huge, but as more and more teams figure out that WebAssembly is useful and WebAssembly can be used to enhance their apps and also to deploy their apps faster, uh, this is going to grow. Uh, I think that over the coming years, more and more companies will be deploying WebAssembly, and so um, as people who deal with observability or as platform maintainers, it's important to know about it and to, to know what to expect. So let's say you believe me, and um, we're going to be deploying more and more WebAssembly uh, into applications and onto computers and servers in the, in the future. Um, let's say you compile your WebAssembly, what do you do, right? So you've taken your code, and I've, I've got a, a very simple example here of um, a very <laughs> overly complicated uh, addition function, but let's just imagine that we're doing some key value things and then we're doing some HTTP things, right? So WebAssembly can be written in terms of interfaces and in terms of the functionality that you want to access. If your platform grants you access to that, and by platform I mean, let's, for example, a Wasm Cloud instance, a Wasm Cloud host, if it grants you that access as a, as a WebAssembly uh, program, you'll be able to do all these operations and deliver a result. Uh, on the right is a small illustration of how we connect uh, WebAssembly, so WebAssembly modules over there in purple, and the capabilities that they require. So here you can see that the code on the left clearly uses some key value operations and then some HTTP stuff. So we've got um, on the right a sort of illustration of a component using a key value provider, um, and provider is a Wasm Cloud term. Uh, since it provides functionality, and then using a HTTP provider to do sort of HTTP-based functionality. Um, these, the strongly typed uh, nature of these interfaces means that generally you, you need to ask for permission to do certain actions and then grant it at the platform level. So you don't have to really focus on this slide too much, but this is a, a little bit about how Wasm Cloud runs and how Wasm Cloud makes available all the capabilities. So what we talked about a little bit um, just now is on, is on the bottom right here, where we have interfaces um, for secrets. We have interfaces for things like key value. We've got things uh, like interfaces for Postgres, so accessing databases. And this means that you don't have to worry about, for example, setting up a connection to your database, right? The connection's just there. You can write your code for your component, just your business logic, as if the connection is there. And then at runtime, when you need to uh, instantiate your component, when you need to run your component, you can hook up the database. Uh, this means a lot of things, but um, some of the most important things is that you get really fast cold start, right? You're, when your component comes up to server requests, you don't start connecting to the database. Database connection is already there, right? Um, you have pluggable databases, right? So if you have an interface for a SQL database, you can plug MySQL to it, you can plug Postgres, Postgres to it, you can plug anything else that speaks sort of SQL if you have the contract written correctly. Now, whether you should do that or not is a, is a different question. Some people like uh, specific databases. But um, another thing this enables is really high density. So we can fit a lot of just business, uh, business logic components on the same machine. So we're here for observability, right? So what does all this have to do with observability? So Wasm Cloud comes with observability out of the box. 
So when you perform an invocation, and this is a, a screenshot of a Grafana dashboard, but when you perform an invocation, we know that an HTTP request, for example, comes in. Or for example, if, if it's not an HTTP request, if it's like from Kafka, a message from Kafka, depends on how your component is triggered. If a HTTP request comes in, we know that an HTTP request has started, an invocation has happened, right? So your component's been called. And then uh, inside your component, um, you can instrument and show even, you can show even uh, a more detailed trace, right? If, you're, if you've hooked up your component or your providers um, uh, with, the right, with the right code. But this, you know, this costs something. This means you have to instrument your component, you have to write code, you have to sort of add to what you have already. So um, how do WebAssembly and observability and OTEL go together? We think they work better together. Um, what we're aiming for is a world where there is no migration step. So you don't, um, moving your code from, let's say, regular Go code to WebAssembly should be easy and should be seamless. And your observability code that's currently present, right, so the OTEL SDK that you're using should just work. That's the world we want to live in. But a little bit farther or further than that is we want instruction level visibility. This is something that we wouldn't dare to do in any other compiled language, right? You probably wouldn't try and edit assembly yourself or take apart you know, the binary in an executable and try and insert instructions. No one would do that. But with WebAssembly, you can. Uh, and we want essentially cross-language traces that just work. So I'm going to show a demo uh, of the case where you want a regular Go app with observability you already have to just work. Um, thanks, a big thanks to Lucas and uh, Jonas, who work at Cosmonic with me, as they helped me put together this demo. Uh, and I'm going to switch to it right now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Is the text large enough? See some nodding? OK. Awesome. All right, so on the left, we've got our sort of usual Go code, right? And this is using the um, regular Go OTEL SDK, right? This is the kind of stuff, this is code honestly very similar to what you would find in the you know, Getting Started Guide, right? There's nothing, nothing um, fancy here except for this little piece, which is actually a custom um, reporter uh, or a custom exporter for traces. That are sent. So this is quite normal. Like if you've if you've used um, OTEL before, obviously you've dealt with like oh now we want to push our traces somewhere else or we want to push our traces to a different provider. You might have you might have done this in the past and changed the um, changed the way you reported your traces. But the rest of this is pretty standard, right? We've got sort of like you know your tracer start. We sort of defer the end of the span to the end of the function. Um, the code is pretty is pretty standard. Um, and what I'm going to show here is an example of this basically normal Go code compiled as a web component um, with tracing and observability working. So some of this will be a little bit Wasm Cloud specific, but I want to make it really clear that this is a general web, like this is general WebAssembly code that actually can run in multiple runtimes. So one of the great things about WebAssembly is that it's an open standard that's being worked on by many companies and many groups. Uh, so what I've done is actually I've started a Wasm Cloud host, which is, you don't need to focus on that too much, but just this is the thing that will run our WebAssembly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy, uh, and I'll show it a little bit here. We've got, um, this looks very somewhat Kubernetes-like uh, in, in form, in that it's, it's a, it's a format and some YAML that we use to declaratively um, deploy applications. But this, again, you don't have to worry too much about it, except for here, where I'm specifying the WebAssembly binary. And again, that is a file that was produced by our build process, um, so a, a Wasm binary, um, and deploying that binary to Wasm Cloud, or just running that binary. So I'm going to run this. OK. So lots of output, but in general, um, what's happening now at this point is that there is an HTTP server provider, which let's say listens on a port. And when it gets a web request in on that port, it triggers the component that we, have, that we saw earlier, the Go code that we saw on the left. And it triggers that component 
And then um, after it triggers that component, we're going to see uh, hotel traces get generated. So let's set up, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with this project, but there's a little project called hotel TUI, or terminal user face for, for hotel. Uh, and what it does is it shows you uh, it sort of spins up a sort of local observability stack uh, and shows you traces as they come in. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit this endpoint. Uh, the endpoint happens to be at 8080, so, and that's um, a configuration thing sort of down here. Not, a, not, a, not terribly important, but just to, so it doesn't look like a, um, a complete mystery. But so we're going to curl this component. And so we've got our component. Uh, it's already responded, right? And so uh, the component that's running is actually a dog image fetcher. So I, I'm not going to open this in the, in the browser, but for those who are watching online or want to or type really fast, you can try and uh, visit that URL and see, uh, see what breed comes up. But um, what's really important is that here at the bottom, we have uh, an hotel span that came through, right? Uh, and so we have a service that's reporting sort of like performing its request, uh, performing this HTTP request, uh, and coming back, and it's pretty seamless, right? The, the, what I'm trying to convince you of here is that your code actually doesn't change much. Your code will just compile to a smaller size, um, go to different places, um, honestly boot faster, uh, and uh, be a lot more secure without much work on your part, right? You won't have to do too much. Uh, most of the Go code is pretty standard here. So just to go again uh, and explain sort of what happened. So I showed you a mostly normal Go code with the small caveat that it was tiny Go. So these are, these are where the sort of lies get, lies get shown. Um, and that compiling that code, that's pretty standard looking Go code down to WebAssembly, was easy. Uh, and obviously it can't all be that easy, right? So the two caveats here that are really important is that we are using a custom exporter which, to be honest, is not a huge caveat because we are, uh, that, that's a common thing to do if you're moving between environments, uh, or let's say providers uh, of, of, of hotel. And we're using um, the code from a newly, or soon to be released, so not yet released, version of TinyGo, right? There are some bugs in the TinyGo code that like, we had to work around, essentially. They're actually fixed upstream now, which is great. Uh, and sorry, these, these bugs weren't really related to WebAssembly, but they just, you know, they're things we ran into as we were, as we were building this. Um, but this should be released soon, hopefully, um, up, upstream in TinyGo. And of course, when changes, um, when WebAssembly lands more, um, so right now there's some WebAssembly landed in BigGo, so that's not TinyGo. Um, but as, that, as some of that stuff lands, it just becomes more and more seamless, right? So these caveats disappear over time. So I actually have one more demo. Uh, this would have been the end, except for what I think uh, many people probably came to this talk for was to see dynamic instrumentation. So I mentioned earlier that you probably would never try and take an x86 binary, look at the assembly, and try and rewrite it, right? That's kind of silly. Or, well, extremely hard. <laughs> so most people wouldn't try and do that, but with WebAssembly, we actually can, right? The, the WebAssembly text format, or called, it's called Watt, is actually relatively simple to read, but even more importantly, there are tools to programmatically uh, manipulate it and change it. So what I'm going to demo next is taking a WebAssembly binary that was compiled, like so let's say thing you can think of Rust code. In this case, it'll be Rust code, but you can think of Go code. Um, and I'm going to give it essentially a list of function names, and we're going to automatically instrument those functions without changing the original code. So I'll get started here and try and explain as I go. I don't think we'll need that just yet. But okay, we'll, uh, we'll start here. And so I'm using a, a tool called Just, which is just you know, a little task runner. And uh, what we're going to do is first, we're going to deploy the uninstrumented version. And let me show you a little bit of what that what that uh, file looks like. And this is, should be familiar at this point since you've seen it once before. This is a uh, declarative uh, deployment file for this WebAssembly component, right? And this file, of course, if you try and open it, is just binary, right? Gibberish. 
So this is a compiled application that already exists. Uh, we're going to see what it does just by, just by hitting it. So I'm going to run a few commands here. Uh, one second. I'm going to turn off this host here because this is still running. And I'm going to run wash up, which in this brings, similar, similar to the uh, previous example, this brings up um, Wasm Cloud, the host. I'm going to list the apps. So the name of this app is called Uninstrumented, just so we can be really clear and know which one is, uh, which one is, is running there. So I'm going to delete the Go app here. Uh, and so we only have one running, which I'll show you here. So we've got one app running. We've got uninstrumented. Now, sort of similar to what we had before, uh, I just know that the, uh, the port this thing is listening on is 8080. So we're going to try and curl it and see what we get. All right. So this is just nothing's happened yet. This is just the regular uh, sort of HTTP code being run in WebAssembly uh, on a Wasm Cloud host, right? But what we want to do is we want to instrument this code so that we can um, get a trace and sort of know when a certain function has entered and exited, right? So when the handler, when the, uh, handler is actually entered and exited. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run a, a program that I've written that will take this binary. And it's, well, it's already done. So there's, 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 really, uh, there's really not much to discuss there. But it's going to take in and read in that uh, WebAssembly binary we were running originally. Without changing the original one, it's going to instrument it, so change the instructions that are running when that WebAssembly binary runs. Uh, and it's going to make a separate second binary that is uh, instrumented. So if we open the second, second binary here, this instrumented one, you can see it's just gibberish again. Right, like um, there are there is a there's a textual format uh, which we can actually read, which I've I've printed out here ahead of time, uh, and this is actually pretty easy to read. Uh, I don't know if many people have read Assembly uh, in the room, but this is sort of like lispy and is a little bit a little bit easier to read than um, Assembly would be. But you can see how you try and you can try and actually change this change this format. But what we're going to do next is we're going to um, deploy the instrumented version of this app. Uh, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when this instrumented version of the app is called. We have a provider that actually hooks into when the function we're, we're looking at is called and when it exits. So we'll see two messages that sort of indicate that the function has been entered uh, and the function has been exited. And after, after we see that, I'll show you exactly what the function looks like so you can see what the uh, sort of delay was. Okay. So now, if I just show you again. Oh. So we've got two. We've got two applications running. One is instrumented, one is not instrumented. Uninstrumented app hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, it's just there. I happen to know that the uh, instrumented app is running at localhost 8081, right? So I'm going to curl it, and here we go. We've got two messages from when the function was entered uh, and when it was exited. So taking the binary just, just from, just taking the binary that we built originally without changing the actual code, we got instrumentation for a function inside the actual code. Now let me show you what that code looks like so you know why this was worth instrumenting. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty trivial component, but um, it's interesting because there's a random slowdown, right? So it's just a regular HTTP handler, but there's actually some code in there that just waits one to three seconds. Uh, and we can see from when the messages, the messages that came in, uh, when it started and when it stopped, that it actually waited one second, right? So we can see that we were able to find out, essentially, the, the hard way, how much random, random weight was injected. And of course, I don't control this weight, so if we hit the, if we hit the end point again, we get a different, uh, we're likely to get a different time, right? Uh, uh, time elapsed in between. So
So just to, just to wrap up again, uh, and I'm almost out of time here, but I'll, I'll jump through these really quick. So what happened? We built a WebAssembly component. Uh, we added instrumentation automatically to the binary that was produced, not in our code, without doing anything to change our original code. In fact, we looked at the code at the end. Uh, and we used a Wasm Cloud provider, which is sort of, sort of spooky action at a distance, you can kind of ignore it, but to catch individual invocations. So obviously, can't be this easy, right? Uh, well, there's a few caveats. One, you need to make sure your language doesn't inline your function, right? So if you want to trace a function and it gets inlined, there's nothing to trace, right? It's inside of another, another, uh, another function. Uh, that and, of course, along with traces, we need logs and metrics to really be fully observable. Uh, and the tooling I built here um, obviously needs to be tested, polished, released. So, you know, this stuff is early, but this is basically what people hope for when they want sort of toil-free observability. Thank you. I know we're out of time, but... <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Victor. If you have questions for Victor, yeah, we have time for one question, and uh, after you. that, you'll be able to find Victor around if you have more. Uh, hi, Victor. So how are you supplying the function names here? Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. The, um, so the question was, uh, how am I supplying the function names? So the function names can be provided actually dynamically. Um, what happens is uh, the script essentially takes a list of function names, and because this is written for Rust, I actually turn those function names um, into Rust identifiers, and then look into the binary and find those identifiers, and then inject code. 